Oh, daar gaat hij. Werkt het? Apparently. Okay, let's see if this is working. If you are just tuning in to the stream after the fact, I would suggest uh, fast forward for five minutes because I'm always has having a lot of trouble starting up my live streams. <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, na, 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 na. Seriously? Right. A lot of trouble starting up my ah, life. Yeah, okay. That worked. So let's hope this keeps on functioning. Let's go public. And we're live. I think, I think we're live. Always a bit of an issue, <laughs> my live streams. Hopefully I'm live and uh, <clears throat> yeah, this is the second uh, Deep Sky Imaging Night for me. <clears throat> and I just uh, wanted to see if there was anybody out here, uh, out there actually on the internet who wanted to join me for uh, this second and I think also last night of Deep Sky Imaging. So we are again looking at the Crescent Nebula, for those of you who joined last night. And uh, yeah, last night I took the H-alpha uh, filter pictures of the Crescent Nebula, and now I am collecting O3 data. And to my surprise, I have a, a reasonable signal-to-noise ratio. I can see the Crescent Nebula. But anyway, let me also try to start up the chat on my phone and as always I have a little bit of issue starting up my own chat <laughs> because I'm basically an idiot right I don't see anyone in the chat all yet so I'll just wait for a couple of minutes and hopefully uh, there are some of you who want to hang out with me I don't know um, but at least, yeah, uh, again, I'm uh, imaging the Crescent Nebula. For those of you who don't know where the Crescent Nebula is, um, we can, of course, start up Stellarium. And, um, yeah, let's search for it. So I'm currently imaging NGC 6888. And as you can see, it is very high up in the sky where I live at least. So this is the Crescent Nebula I'm imaging right now. Um, and when we zoom out, you can see that at least from my latitude, 52 degrees latitude, um, it is almost in the zenith. So I'm actually, my telescope is facing north of course, and uh, you can see it's almost right up there. And that's actually perfect because it doesn't give me a lot of atmospheric turbulence. And um, yeah, last night I captured uh, the H alpha data of the Crescent Nebula. And tonight I have this sequence where I, um, <clears throat> yeah, maybe I can, can talk about that a little bit because I started collecting uh, sulfur data, S2 narrowband data. And um, yeah, what can I say? Um, I didn't get a lot of signal in S2 from the Crescent Nebula, so I don't know if anybody uh, experienced that um, as well. And we have the first one here in the chat, and that is Nasser Astronomy. Hi Nasser, um, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. And um, yeah, I'm just imaging the Crescent Nebula here and uh, was wondering if there are any people online who wanted to join me for uh, basically a deep sky capturing of the Crescent Nebula. <clears throat> so uh, nice to see you on the stream. And um, yeah, as always, I think I should wait a couple of minutes and let's, let's see if there are other people who want to join as well. 
Um, yeah, my current setup is, as always, the famous Edge HD 8-inch telescope. And I always have a lot of discussion with uh, people. Uh, but anyway, I really like that telescope. Uh, I bought it last year and it's giving me the results I was looking for. So uh, if anyone wants to ask about that. Um, and the thing I like most about the Edge HD is, of course, it's longer focal length. And you can do deep sky imaging with the Edge HD 8 inch, as you can see. Um, and I do this with an F7 reducer on the back of my uh, telescope. And uh, yeah, uh, it brings my focal length down to about 1500 millimeters, but that's of course still uh, a super high focal length. Um, so it's a challenge always to accurately track the stars, and but, but the payoff is that you can zoom in on these smaller targets. And um, I'm just uh, babbling here about uh, deep sky imaging, so if you have any questions, uh, if you want to say hi, if you want to get into a discussion, uh, don't hesitate and, um, and uh, put your questions or comments in the chat. Um, loads of content. This is great. Yes, Sam, I think you also was here last night. And maybe I'm going a bit crazy. Maybe this is too much, uh, like uh, two nights in a row, a live stream. But um, the reason I'm doing it, or I decided to do it, is because of the weather. So you can see here, um, we have one more clear night in the Netherlands. This is the Netherlands. Uh, ignore the red dots because they are not facing the right way. But I'm living here in the Netherlands, so this is basically the northwest of Europe. And you can see it here, eh? the clouds. Let's press play here. So the, the clouds are slowly moving towards the Netherlands uh, right now. The UK is out of luck. Maybe a little bit of Scotland is still has still clear skies. Um, so yeah, clouds are moving up, and uh, the expectations are that tomorrow we will have uh, clouds again. So this is uh, Meteor Blue. I'm always checking out uh, the astronomical seeing conditions on Meteor Blue. And yeah, this is for tonight. So we should have clear skies with also a new moon here, 3% new moon. Um, and I think this is basically my final, uh, my final opportunity to do some deep sky imaging because this is for the, for the next days. We have a lot of clouds, as you can see here. And the seeing conditions are, yeah, for the Netherlands are good. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, let's see. I see we have 14 people in the chat. So that's already nice. So I can hang out with you. Thank you for joining. Uh, Emerald Hill Sky says, so great to be here with you. You're the reason I bought the Skywatcher EQ6 R Pro. Okay. And um, Emerald Hills, um, if that's your name. <laughs> Emerald Hills. Is Emerald like this color and hills? No, I'm going to need it. I, I'm, I'm picturing some nice scenery here. Uh, in my head, but um, I hope the EQ6R Pro delivers uh, for you as well uh, as it delivers for me. Um, and speaking about the EQ6R Pro, we can, of course, always check the guiding for tonight. And uh, I've been stupid, but anyway, we can talk about it later. But uh, this is my guiding for the, lead, for the past, what is it, five minutes, I think. Every uh, dotted line is... 30 or 60 seconds, I forgot. Can I see that somewhere? Um, but anyway, I'm uh, now imaging and yeah, my RA is at 0.40 and my deck is at 0.44. And of course this is relative to the scope, but uh, yeah, I, I know from experience that this is a pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, figure to be in. And um, actually I didn't, uh, yeah, what, what, what do I want to say? I, did, uh, I didn't uh, polar align my scope tonight. So I did that before, I think, two or three days, uh, days in advance. And I just uh, aim, I just, just went uh, imaging. And to my surprise, it is tracking quite well. So that's great because I'm at 1500 millimeter focal length, more or less. So uh, you need to have reasonable tracking. Um, catching photons. 
Hey, Rido, nice to see you. Catching photos. Um, thank you for joining the stream. And um, your, I think catching photos, your Chris. Chris has its own YouTube channel, loads of information, so check him out as well. Um, and Chris, you are from Germany, if I'm correct. Saw your last video on Planetary. It was nuts. <laughs> Do you think so? I, I'm actually... Um, um, what can I say? Yeah, I I, uh, I think I, I did a couple of things. I did some live streams on Jupiter and Saturn, and I put out a video on 10 tips uh, where I talk about the kind of gear you can use to get into extra, to uh, get into planetary imaging. Um, also, the kind of software to use to capture and process the, the planets. Um, but, but keep in mind, I am not an expert planetary imager yet, I have to say. Um, I'm already glad that I have like the uh, HHD 8 inch telescope, which has the focal length. It has 2000 millimeter focal length, which allows me to catch, uh, some surface details on Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, I'm already glad that I caught some of it. Um, but still, I think I, uh, I, I can definitely improve. And also the astronomical scene conditions were not great. Um, Sam says, keep it up. Oh, yeah, 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 I, I will, uh, Sam. Um, if we have some clear skies and I can uh, broadcast live, I will do it. Um, Greg Wells, hello from Texas. Hello, Greg. Uh, Perry is here from Rochester, New York. Nice to see you back. Clear skies, finally for you. Yes, Perry, we are now capturing the Crescent Nebula again. It's maybe a little bit boring because I'm always, um, yeah, I'm always, we've got, with narrowband imaging, it's just, of course, capturing these long exposure pictures. And uh, uh, I kind of made it a standard for me to capture um, narrowband um, pictures at about five minutes each. So that's what I'm doing right now. Um, Emerald Hill Skies, it does. Okay, <laughs> great to hear. Um, uh, Jacinto Artigas says hi from Venezuela. Buenos dias. And we have Suisui, <laughs> if I'm pronouncing that correctly. The Greg watching from Ireland. Ah, you're, that's a, that's a, a, a less difficult to pronounce, uh, Greg. And I have watched a few of your videos. Good content. Keep it going. Thank you very much. Greg, I really appreciate positive feedback. And if you have negative feedback, you can also talk to me about that as well. Um, one of them should probably be my Dutch accent. But uh, anyway, uh, thanks for joining, Greg. And Motivatie Games. That's a Dutch, uh, uh, Dutch name, I think. Hey, I just bought a National Geographic 115 500 millimeter telescope. Is that a good one? Um, <laughs> yeah, what is good? Eh? Um, I would say if this is your first telescope and you're uh, you're going to look through the eyepiece and you are aiming at the moon, um, you will be amazed. I think the first time I looked at to the moon with a with a I think as a refractor with a similar focal length of about uh, 600 millimeters. I was truly amazed to see all the details on the moon. Um, and also, he can it is uh, I, the focal length is a little bit short for planetary um, uh, visual planetary observations. Uh, but, you know, um, anything what gets you excited to watch the night sky is already, already fun. If you want to do like high quality uh, astrophotography, so imaging objects in the night sky, um, unfortunately, it can quickly get more expensive and you need a higher quality telescope. Um, but anyway, I think everybody who started out astrophotography are, let's say, an interest in astronomy and an interest in the night sky. And the first thing I did, I bought a pair of binoculars. The second thing I did, I bought, I think, 500 euros uh, Acromet uh, refractor telescope with an altitude azimuth mount. And then I, uh, yeah, over the years, I would say I have invested more and more and I uh, became completely uh, addicted to this hobby, actually. Um, so, yeah. 
Oli Astro is here again. Oli from Australia. Hi, Wido. Just turning in for my morning Astro news. <laughs> my partner is like who is the Dutch voice each morning. <laughs> Oli, um, I hope I am not annoying you too much and I hope you had a nice cup of coffee um, and I hope you had a good night of sleep. Um, and hopefully you have some clear skies in the southern hemisphere as well. Um, for us, the past uh, three weeks have been terrible. We have had a lot of clouds and uh, finally we have some clear skies. So um, I'm just taking... Uh, uh, I, I take every opportunity to, to now capture uh, deep sky objects basically I actually I uh, I was kind of uh, in doubt because uh, you could also do uh, additional I was was into planetary imaging and I did a couple of live streams and it was a little bit on the fence of uh, returning to deep sky astrophotography or taking additional videos of Jupiter and Saturn and process them because that is also a lot of fun um, but in the end, the astrophotographer in me uh, got the uh, the upper hand. Is that a, a sentence? So I chose the Crescent Nebula here. Hi, Vido. Greetings from Felserbroek. So, you you are probably Dutch, and I hope you have a nice, um, ah, a nice evening. Maybe you're also watching uh, the sky. In the Netherlands, we have clear skies tonight, so I would say take the most of it. Um, or get the most out of it, I should say. Eric, of Eric Scanland, hello from Michigan. Hello, Eric. From the US, I think it's still daytime, right? So, hope you have some clear skies, but I saw on, I think, Chuck's channel uh, that you had thunderstorms last night, if I'm correct. So, uh, yeah, I hope the, the sky cleared up a little bit for you. Um, yeah, so people, oh, 32 people already <laughs> for this one image of the Crescent Nebula. And yeah, uh, ask me any kind of questions if you like, or uh, if you want to get into a conversation with other people on the chat, uh, feel free to do so. And um, maybe I can explain my sequence a little bit. Most of you would already uh, understand maybe what I'm doing. Um, but what I'm doing right now, for those of you who are maybe a little bit newer to astrophotography, is that I am engaging in narrowband imaging. And narrowband imaging is basically, um, basically it is the kind of astrophotography that saves the person's who, like me, who live in a city center or live under uh, severe light polluted skies. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm in the Netherlands. Maybe I can, I can show you this. So let's, let's get that light pollution map uh, going. I'm always looking at light pollution map. I'm sure that a lot of you already know this website. Um, so I can show you where I am. I always have trouble zooming in or something like that. I cannot, can I pinch? Anyway, we, I am here currently in the Netherlands, right here in this red zone. And that is, of course, yeah, I click. see. Is it, we are around border class. We are definitely not at border class five. Um, can I zoom in here? Nope. Um, let's give me another try. No, oh here that plus sign. Sign, I think. Yeah. yeah. Now we're getting somewhere. So this is basically Western Europe. This is the Netherlands, and I'm here at Utrecht, and it's indicating class six. But I'm really in the center of the city, so that is really class seven, class eight. Um, so yeah. Anyway. Uh, let's get back to the Crescent Nebula. Um, it is then still surprising that under these light polluted skies, I can get an image like the Crescent Nebula. And the way we do it is uh, we engage in narrow band imaging, uh, where we take a very small band of the light spectrum, and uh, we can image only the light, or uh, the, the filter only passes light in a very specific uh, yeah, part of the the, the visual uh, light spectrum, and in this case, it's collecting O3 data. 
and it's only collecting seven nanometers of bandwidth and all the light pollution then gets blocked and you only receive this signal so that's pretty awesome and that's actually also the trick that you can use when you are living in uh, light polluted uh, uh, city skies um let's see who is here um <laughs> absolutely Joop Remkes, I just tuned in. Can you tell me something about the camera you are using right now? I'm starting astrophotography and looking for a camera. Can you comment a bit on DSLR versus ZWO style cameras? Yeah, um, I can you, and probably also a lot of, of other people in the chat. I think most of us started out with a DSLR camera. Uh, the main reason of uh, to start astrophotography with a DSLR is that you probably already own one. So uh, you don't have to invest in any additional camera. So that's super nice, of course. Um, but there are also some drawbacks of your DSLR. One, one thing is that your DSLR has an uh, IR cut filter, an infrared cut filter, uh, that blocks light in the red part of the light spectrum above a certain uh, uh, number of, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, uh, close, like the red part of the light spectrum close to the infrared, it gets blocked because uh, it allows you to take good uh, uh, color calibrated daytime pictures. But a lot of the objects that we are capturing in space, they are actually in the red part of the light spectrum. So what you can do to upgrade your DSLR is to remove that IR cut filter. Uh, another thing you can do with a DSLR to improve your, what we call signal to noise ratio to get a better picture, uh, basically, is also to get some filters. You have some clip-in filters, they are called. And lots of us use, for instance, a light pollution filter or a hydrogen alpha filter. And uh, yeah, I have actually separate videos on my channel. I don't want to promote my own videos too much in the live stream. Um, where I actually explain how these filters work and how you can also use them in combination with the DSLR. So I, I, you can use your DSLR. It already gi gives you a good like entry level uh, way to get into astrophotography. But at one point, I think you will also uh, want to have a, a dedicated astrophotography camera. And if we are talking about deep sky cameras or ZWO cameras, you also have QHI is a very popular brand. Um, the, the main advantage these cameras have is that they are, of course, made for deep sky astrophotography uh, or planetary imaging. You have to take care. There are two types of cameras, dedicated astrophotography cameras. Um, and the main differences are is that this particular camera I'm using right now, this is the ASI 1600 Mono Pro. It's definitely not the cheapest camera, also not the most expensive uh, camera, but uh, yeah, you have to pay, uh, yeah, about, or they are around a thousand euros a dollars, so that's not cheap. Uh, but the main advantage is here that you, you can see it here, I hope you can see it. Uh, you have a little box here, uh, it says temperature and I'm cooling my sensor. So I'm now at minus 15 degrees Celsius. And it really, really helps to uh, reduce the noise in your picture. So you get a higher quality picture. And uh, yeah, of course, these dedicated astrophotography cameras, they are made for deep sky imaging. So they have a low read noise. They have a relatively high quantum efficiency um, and so on. So I hope this helps you a little bit. And I also have, I have uh, also a couple of videos about uh, cameras about dedicated uh, astrophotography cameras and also ZWO cameras so check that out if you are interested um, I think I have lost my chat again let's see <laughs> I will start it up again so uh, yeah guys 32 people here very nice to to show you this one live image of O3 data of the Crescent Nebula so I can actually show you. I um, this is a little bit, uh, yeah. This is like a bit, a bit monotonous, I would say. <laughs> um, but I'm just catching these five minute pictures of the Crescent Nebula, and uh, this program I'm using is Sequence Generator Pro. 
And with the Sequence Generator Pro, I connect all of my astrophotography gear. So you can see here, I have a camera connected. Um, I have a filter wheel connected with filters in it. Um, and I have my EQ6R Pro. This is an equatorial mount connected to this particular program. And uh, yeah, it works pretty well. You can, um, if you connect software to your gear, it basically allows you to automatically slew to deep sky uh, targets. Uh, so it, uh, it saves you a lot of hassle. So if you have to do that manually, uh, of course, you are always, that, that always takes up more time. Um, and I think the most uh, impressive thing for, for modern day technology software is that we have plate solving also. So plate solving really uh, uh, gets you on the target you want, want to image without any kind of effort. Uh, and what basically uh, Sequence Generator Pro does is it takes a picture of the night sky when you are close to the target that you want to image. And uh, it will then compare it to a, to a star chart uh, it has in its own database. And uh, of course, when uh, the plate, uh, the, the picture is matched to a particular part of the star chart, uh, Sequence Generator Pro will inform your mount uh, where the position is at the moment and it will slew uh, this will slew to the target you want to image. So that's super, super awesome. Uh, Yup says, perfect. Thanks. Yeah, Yup. I, I hope I did not ramble too much. <laughs> what? Oh, um, Greg from Ireland, uh, who also calls his, himself SW2 or Swiss. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Sky Tracker Pro? For tracking a nice sky, I'm thinking of buying one. Well, actually, I didn't use a sky tracker with a DSLR yet. So that's uh, uh, unfortunate. But I can't help you there. I know that there is a Skywatcher mount that is pretty popular. Um, so, yeah. And in general, I think it is, it is interesting, especially when you are interested in uh, like this astroscape, like wide field astrophotography pictures of the night sky. If you want to take it with your DSLR camera and you want uh, to track the stars so you can increase your exposure time, it is definitely a good idea uh, to get a tracker. But maybe some other people in the chat, they use trackers as well and they can... Uh, inform you a little bit about the different options you have. Um, and actually, I was a little bit sad uh, during this holiday. I spent my holiday in France, in the south of France. Um, and uh, yeah, I have also a wife and two daughters. So the entire uh, the car was filled with uh, stuff that didn't have anything to do with uh, astro photography. So I only took my DSLR camera and a tripod. And um, now I I was under some super dark skies in the south of France, and I was really like disappointed that I didn't have my gear with me. But yeah, it's also nice to have your family with you, of course. Um, but I think a, mo a Star Trekker would have fitted my uh, in the car. So I'm thinking about next year when we uh, maybe go to uh, to a dark sky uh, or a dark side again. Uh, I will try to also to get um, a tracker with me and then uh, hopefully I will succeed in making longer exposure pictures of the Milky Way especially. That's what I would be interested in. So, yeah. Uh, what can I say? Uh, I think this is, uh, this is what I'm doing. I think we still have quite some way to go. So um, the O3 data, actually, this is the uh, the filter that is most challenging for me to uh, image the Crescent Nebula. Um, and normally I don't get a good signal, but tonight I'm, I can clearly see some nebulosity. So I'm super excited about that, actually. So um, yeah, and my sequence is that I'm going to take uh, 30 pictures. And I also took 30 O3 pictures last night. So I will end up hopefully with about uh, 50 pictures in O3 and also 50 pictures in H alpha. Uh, I know the H alpha filter has a much stronger signal uh, for the Crescent Nebula because there's a lot of hydrogen uh, gas in that nebula. Um, so, yeah. 
Sebastian Hood. Howdy. Howdy. <laughs> Says, hello guys, hello Guido. Hi Sebastian, thank you for joining the chat. And um, yeah, on a personal note, um, we have, have had some, uh, some challenging circumstances in the house because uh, my two daughters, uh, they both were tested positive on COVID, on Corona during the first week they went to school. So that was pretty hard. So, um, and there were also other people uh, or other children and even the teacher had the coronavirus. Um, but as luck would have it, I don't have the virus. Uh, I was tested negative and tonight I was tested again, but I'm feeling great. And um, so lucky for me. And my daughters, they do not experience any symptoms, actually. Or, yeah, mild symptoms at the most. They are a little bit like having a cold. Uh, but that's about it, luckily. And, uh, yeah, hopefully it gets resolved soon because now we have to do this, this homeschooling also again. Um, but anyway, that's not related to astrophotography at all. What is your favorite DSO? Yes, Sam. Maybe we can talk about that. That's a better topic. Um, and Don R says five minute exposures. Yes, I am now taking five minute exposures of the night sky. So that is super challenging to, uh, you have, you have to have an equatorial mount and you have to track your target for multiple minutes very precisely. And then you end up with these kind of pictures. Um, and what is my favorite DSO? That is a tricky question. Um, I did, you know, they are also challenging targets for me, but I really, really love to image uh, smaller galaxies. So um, I think yeah, we will have to wait until February, March again. Um, but I do like to uh, to try because they are very challenging. But for instance, the Whirlpool Galaxy, I really was amazed with the picture I took of the Whirlpool Galaxy early on in this uh, this year. Um, and yeah, you have the pinwheel galaxy as well, of course. Um, but it, it also depends a little bit on the kind of equipment you have. If you have like uh, a focal length of 500 millimeters, like uh, an apochromatic refractor telescope, uh, then I would definitely go for nebulas. And they are still, if you look at uh, nebulas now, uh, of course, we are now in September, but there are still some awesome big nebulas in the sky. You could image also, uh, yeah, with a, like a focal length of 500 millimeters. So, yeah, you of course have the North America nebula, of course, very famous. I think every, you have all kinds of nebula in Cygnus. So let me show you that. So close to the nap here. That's a very bright star. Even in the city, you will, you will be able to spot the nap. So just east of the nap, you have here a lot of nebulosity. So the North America nebula and the Pelican nebula are very famous. If you go a little bit south, if I'm correct, always trying. Yeah, this is maybe a little bit farther south. You also have this is super famous also, the Cygnus Loop uh, with the Eastern Veil nebula and the Western Veil nebula. And this is oh, I always forget this Pickard's triangle or something like that. Um, but I really like that uh, that region, so the the southern region, and I'm actually here right now, so um, I'm close to southern. They also call this uh, area surrounding the star southern, or is it Seder? I don't know how to pronounce it. I think it's an Arab name, so it should be maybe Sod. <laughs> um, and here is the Crescent Nebula. So you can see we are close to, I'm zooming in and out, hope you don't get uh, seasick <laughs> from me just uh, zooming in and out of Stellarium. But uh, yeah, we are currently here at the Crescent Nebula. You can see how, um, you can also check this on. So this is my field of view with my Edge HD 8-inch camera and the ASI 1600 Mono Pro camera um, and the 0.7 reducer. So this is also nice. You can uh, set up, you know, maybe I should do, a, there are a lot of videos already out there, but I could also do one where you can, uh, you can set up Stellarium and Stellarium is very nice to, to, to do things like this. So I can see here in, in advance 
um, if the particular picture I want to take, how this would look on my particular camera, on the in the field of view of my camera. Um, anyway, I will check back on my attempt to image the crescent. Um, and let's see if you have other questions as well. Good evening from Kansas City, Mike Mason. Hello, Mike. How are you doing? Um, Paul Wood is here from the from York, UK. Oh, I just I just checked the UK, but I think you're out of luck for tonight, right? So there is there are some clouds hanging over the UK, unfortunately. But maybe you're up north, then you would still have clear skies. Um, how easy, difficult is it to align sub, subs taken on different nights if you don't have a permanent setup? Does parallax come into play if they are taken months apart? Well, Paul, um, the short answer to that is that it is definitely possible to uh, take a deep sky picture, especially deep sky pictures. Um, across multiple nights or even across weeks or months and you would still be able to use that combined data to um, yeah, to stack all of these separate images together because um, they are so distant like the crescent nebula let's let's for instance take this uh, deep sky target as an example um, I should get some information I think I checked off all the information uh, here Information short. <laughs> hope you will be able to see it. Let's hope I can click on. Yeah, maybe I'm zoomed in too much. So out. Let's try to. Uh, it doesn't take the crescent. That's unfortunate. Maybe I should switch off this. Uh, let me try again. I'm pressing like hell to select this particular target. It doesn't do it. Oh, why not? Oh, maybe I should do this. Yeah, the crescent. Ah, finally. Um, no, then I should not go for the short, but for the all available. Let's see if it has... Uh, it doesn't have information on light years. So here we have distance. So you see that um, the Crescent Nebula, this is amazing, it's 4,700 light years away. So at that distance, yeah, the, the little parallax thing you are talking about, like the Earth goes around the Sun, and it's, I think it's like about 300 million kilometers uh, um, difference, right? But at this like 5,000 light years almost the distance, you will not notice that uh, in your pictures and especially not at the magnification levels we are using as astrophotographers. Um, so yeah, th that's a good thing. Eh? So you can image uh, uh, targets uh, at clear, because yeah, we are in Western Europe <laughs> and we have a lot of cloudy nights. So uh, sometimes it takes a couple of days or even weeks to image uh a particular deep sky object in different colors, for instance, or in different uh, in, at different exposure times, and so on. Uh, but the short, yeah, this is not so short answer anymore. But you can do it. <laughs> um, Mike Mason, uh, currently my Canon T5 is currently being modified. Very good. Is that a Rebel T5? I also started with that camera, exact camera. Uh, only in Europe, it is called the. Uh, Canon 1200D. And Mike, I don't have any idea why the Canon cameras in the United States sometimes have different names. <laughs> I think like the 60D and the 60DA and uh, the Canon RA, they are all they all have similar names, but sometimes like the entry level cameras they have different names. I don't know why because we are a global community. Joop Remke says, you mentioned the filter wheel. Do you take pictures with different filters and then stack them together? Or do you just use the specific filter for the object? All the best with the COVID situation. Yeah, we will survive the COVID situation, you probably. Um, but thank you for the support. 
And um, yes, I think there are two ways to get into astrophotography. So if you are using your DSLR camera, of course, this is a color camera. So you will take a color picture of the night sky, um, which which is great because it simplifies your post-processing uh, steps you have to take. So I would really suggest if you just start out astrophotography, uh, use a color camera and then uh, maybe in combination with some kind of light pollution filter and uh, yeah, get into imaging and you just end up with like 50, 60, 20, 30 pictures and you stack them together and you get a color image of the deep sky object you wanted to image. But there is of course a but and the main but is <laughs> uh, that Actually, uh, if you use a monochrome camera like I'm doing right now, we are looking at a black and white picture. Um, if you're using a monochrome camera, um, a monochrome camera is better able to capture uh, more light in a specific part of the light spectrum. So, for instance, if you are using a red filter in combination with your monochrome camera, um, uh, light you are collecting from your deep sky object it can act, it, it will get like if it is in the red part of the light spectrum that um, photon basically will pass your filter and it can land anywhere on your sensor so it will always yeah depending on your quantum efficiency but it will always register that particular uh, photon of light whereas if you are using your DSLR camera it has a Bayer matrix it has a red filter, a blue filter, and two green filters for every pixel, actually. So um, chances are that when uh, you're collecting light, for instance, in the red part of the light spectrum, and that red uh, light hits like either a green or a blue filter on your Bayer matrix, it will not get registered. Anyway, long story short, monochrome imaging, it allows you to get uh, a better signal to noise ratio or better quality picture uh, for each of the different filters uh, or the colors, if you will. For each of the different colors that you use, you can get a better picture. And what I'm doing here is a specific sub thing. So I'm doing narrow band imaging right now. And narrow band imaging is actually uh something special like i said before it's uh it only takes a very small bandwidth of the light spectrum and it passes only photons that are exactly on that bandwidth um and there are um yeah like in deep space there are objects that emit a lot of light on a very narrow bandwidth um so i'm i'm taking here oxygen um, and I know the Crescent Nebula has some oxygen because it has a shock shell, um, basically, of, of different uh, gases colliding with each other. And uh, yeah, you can see it here. And if you use a narrow band filter, like I said before, it blocks out all of the light from like the light polluted city center, or actually all the light that doesn't fit that narrow band uh, filter. Anyway, I hope I, I explained that a little bit um, so that you can understand what I'm doing. Have you tried the Bubble Nebula, Dom R says? Yeah, the Bubble Nebula. That's actually, that is an awesome target. And I think it's a good target for September also, right? I didn't yet, actually. So now you make me curious. Let's check the Bubble and are there any other questions? Hi, Wido, have you imaged the Pleiades? If so, what filter did you use? Yes, Jim, I did image the Pleiades. Um, and I used a couple of different things. I first imaged it in color, but I didn't get got the like the dust lanes out quite 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 so well. So what I also did was then in with a monochrome camera, I imaged it in the blue part of the light spectrum just by using a blue filter and also a, an O3 filter, like the, the one I'm using right now, the Crescent Nebula. And that actually amazed me. Um, I think like the blue part and the O3 narrowband filter, it really um, allowed me to get also these dust lanes in the, in the, the Pleiades uh, between the stars. So that's pretty nice. And of course the Pleiades is also a wide field, um, like, yeah, I would say a wide, field target. 
So if you have a small telescope with maybe a 400 or 500 millimeters focal length, you can already fit, you can fit the Pleiades. It's already a big object in your field of view. So that's also pretty nice. Um, more questions? I'm up north, so it's clear. Bortle 452. Ah, that's nice to hear, Paul. And Boss Pierce says, yep, the clouds got me at sundown. I did get some nice sun, sun post images today. Yeah, that is, of course, also very uh, interesting to get into solar uh, photography. And that is an entire different approach to uh, imaging objects in the night sky, or you're just imaging the sun, one object. But it is so awesome to see uh, the sunspots and you have these, uh, I think, prominences they are called. Uh, super, super interesting to capture uh, those. And you can create these time-lapse videos as well. I didn't know, I don't know if you did that as well. Uh, but it's super awesome. Um, framing, reframing in different sessions. Guys, you really should look into Nina. Yeah, I know I'm using Sequence Generator Pro still, uh, Macarono, but Nina, I think, is free software. So definitely. And uh, like I said before, I think that the biggest advantage, I think also Nina has it, Astrophotography Tool also has, I think, an option uh, to plate solve. If you have software that can plate solve your image, you will be able to, like, to frame that particular deep sky object exactly um, like you did before on different nights in your field of view. So you can just save your sequence, save the way you image that object, and then uh, on a different night, you can just slew back to that object if you have plate solving. Deep Sky Stacker can do batch stacking. That's true. I did that, I think, uh, two or three years ago. It was one of my first videos where I tried to explain that uh, with Deep Sky Stacker, you can actually um, also, when you use like a monochrome um, camera, you can you can actually uh, like stack red, blue, and green um, um, pictures you took. You can create different stacks for them, and then Deep Sky Stacker can integrate all of them. Uh, and it's a free software, of course. So uh, also very nice to check that out if you're just starting. The calibration frames are the biggest pain. Yes, Mike, that is true. And I think the most important thing you need to uh, realize is that dark frames have to be matched, preferably, if, if you can, in exposure time and also temperature. Um, yeah, and I think especially tricky is to take flat frames. I have a different videos on that. Um, and yeah, you can, you can of course check out how to do it depending on the equipment you have. Um, but I'm also, you are always using flats and darks. I don't do a lot with bias frames actually. How do you know if your exposure is good enough for faint deep sky objects? How do you pick gain, time, binning, etc., to get enough data? <laughs> yeah, Phil, that is a really good question. And I think um, the, the answer is a little bit trial and error, but that, that's, not a, that's not a very good answer, of course. Um, uh, I think that the, it depends a lot on the camera. And uh, if you look on the internet, like I have the ASI 1600 Mono Pro, and if you check out Astrobin, for instance, people using that camera, they often use Unity Gain. And Unity Gain on the ASI 1600 Mono Pro is 139 Gain. So for this particular camera, I'm using 139 Gain. And uh, that actually gave me pretty good results. And also uh, exposure time. You could say that longer exposure times are better because you are catching more light. But of course, when like, I am now, I'm now taking five minute exposures, and of course the, the how do you can say the, the 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 other side of it is that you when you take a uh, long exposure pictures, uh, you're guiding. Why is it not showing that? <laughs> I want to show you PhD too. Um, ah, okay. I don't know why it's not responding. 
maybe like this. Uh, let's see if I can. For some reason, it is locked. Um, but anyway, um, so the, the longer your exposure is, the better your tracking should be. So if your tracking is a little bit inaccurate or you have some difficulty uh, tracking the night sky for multiple minutes, then you will, of course, end up with star trails, elongated stars. So actually, this per you can see it in this picture as well. But for some reason, I can't really access my mini PC that is outside. Maybe another thing I can talk about. <laughs> Um, I will try to get... Oh, maybe it's because of Stellarium. All right. Can I do it now? Yeah. So this is actually PhD2. Eh? So I have a guide scope as well. It's taking one second pictures of the night sky and it found this one star. Actually, this is a very low... Normally, I get a rich star field with my guide scope and camera, but uh, now I only see three stars. You can see PhD2 is tracking that star every second and... It sends corrections to my my mount, in this case, the EQ6R Pro. And that allows me to stay on the target for multiple minutes and take long exposure pictures. But sometimes your tracking isn't that good, and that also limits your exposure time, of course. So I would say, yeah, it depends a little bit on the camera, the gain setting, etc. cetera. Um, the exposure time, it depends a little bit on the brightness of the object itself. You want to image and also the quality of the tracking you have uh, with your particular mount. Uh, I know with the EQ6R Pro, I have sub arc accuracy in tracking most of the time. Uh, like you see here, it's below one uh, arc second here in RA and DEC. But I also have owned a Celestron AVX and that AVX also always tracked a little bit less accurate, about one arc seconds or sometimes even 1.5 arc seconds of accuracy. Um, and anyway, then it also depends on the focal length, of course. Because if you are imaging, I'm imaging at 1500 millimeters focal length, so then you have to have quite accurate tracking. But if you are imaging at 500 millimeters focal length or 250 millimeters focal length, um, of course, then you're zoomed out more and the tracking doesn't have to be that accurate to still get pinpoint stars and uh, and objects in your field of view. Anyway, I'm talking way too much. <laughs> the calibration frame are the biggest pain I already read at. Um, now, Phil, I hope I, uh, I, I gave you some info here that made sense. I tried on a crap seeing night, all garbage. Yes, done. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Sometimes, um, especially in autumn or winter, it is uh, then it, it, it is uh, sometimes weeks go by or even a month goes by without any opportunity to do some deep sky astrophotography. And then when the, one of these crappy nights uh, comes along and you have some seeing, uh, I'm always setting up my rig. And I know in advance that uh, the pictures are will not be that super great, but uh, uh, still it allows me to practice a little bit my skills also. Uh, so yeah, unfortunately, I'm in the northwest of Europe and we don't have the best weather or seeing conditions. Um, so I should I should take take a trip or I should maybe open up a second uh, uh, second spot in the south of Europe or somewhere else where you have more clear nights. I know a lot of people in Spain. Or they have a second setup in Spain, and uh, yeah, they have what they have. They have basically twice the, the the clear nights as compared to the Netherlands. So I'm pretty jealous. Um, oh, I'm running behind on the chat, of course. Could anyone in the chat recommend a ZWO color camera for planetary and DSO on a tight budget? Yeah, the 120 MC. Did somebody shout it out already? To Perry. Yeah, Perry, I think the, the 120 MC is about 120 euros or dollars, something like that. I don't know if that fits your budget. Uh, Base Pierce says a UHC filter is a good all rounder for deep space, space objects. Yes, that's true. It blocks out, uh, yeah, parts of the light pollution that are often, uh, in, in, in light polluted cities. I should be proofreading my comments again. <laughs> okay. I didn't know. Did you have a comment um, that didn't fit the chat so well? Jack, 
I bought my first telescope, a 12 inch Dobbs Skywatcher, wow. But I can't seem to, but I can't seem to create details, the seeing or something like that. Any tips? I actually, I didn't own a, a, a such a, a large aperture Dobsonian telescope, uh, Jack. So I think you can collimate Dobsonians, right? So I don't know if you already checked the collimation. So if you defocus on a bright star, uh, you should have these, like these, I think concentric rings, if that's a word, like the, the rings should be exactly spread out in a similar fashion around that star. And if you see that, like the black spot in the middle of the star is a little bit down or up or left or right, then your telescope is in need of collimation. So that could be an issue if you are not getting these clear views. Um, Astro Quest 1 in the house. Nice to see you. APT and Nina both played so, played so very well. Yeah, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, options. That's so great to, to see that. And welcome to the chat, uh, Astro Quest. Um, Nina had also just uh, added a polar line feature. Oh, that's interesting. Thanks for letting me know, Oli. Uh, APT has an additional manual frame mask tool. Okay. I don't, I never use that actually. Um, I managed the dump Dalek observatory. I managed to play it solve for the first time with APT, although I really need to change my aging CCD as it struggles. Yep. I know. I think after two or three years, it's, it's also like the warrant when the warranty year runs out. Uh, usually you get some issue. <laughs> Um, I had this with one camera actually. After three years, it, uh, it quit a little bit. Uh, yeah, like it didn't work so well anymore. Three point photo lighting in Nina is great and very fast. One minute done. The drift lighting in PSD2 is more accu accurate. Yes, Microvono, if I pronounce it correctly. I used, um, I used Drift aligning for those spaces. I have a balcony basically, uh, where I cannot see the North Star. So for me, um, I'm just roughly polar aligning that mount. And then I, uh, I actually flip on PHC2 and engage in drift, um, drift aligning to actually, uh, get, a, yeah, it's not super accurate, but it's accurate enough, especially for small size uh, repacker telescopes. Is there a difference, Dennis Payne, is there a difference between 101 second images or 10, 10 second imaging, assu images, assuming focus tracking, etc.? Yeah, there it definitely is. Um, because if you are, if you, if you have perfect tracking, basically, when you take longer exposure pictures, you will uh, be able to capture more light from a weak ob object, such as the Crescent Nebula we are looking at right now. So, and if you are able to capture more light from that object, your signal to noise ratio increases. Um, and also when you capture, um, targets at l a longer exposure time, it actually reduces the noise quite a lot in your picture. You don't have to, for instance, use a high gain setting to, to see that target. So you get a much smoother picture that is also much better to post process. Uh, so that's my opinion. I don't know if there are other people with different opinions because there are, there is also a whole community that engages in, engages in what is called lucky imaging. And they literally take like thousands or maybe five, six, ten thousands of pictures of a particular object and they stack all of those pictures together. And one particular advantage that you do have uh, when you are engaging in such lucky imaging is that some, some, you sometimes you have, um, like atmospheric turbulence or you always have it in the sky. And when you take these long exposure tick pictures, of course, one of the risks is that your picture gets a little bit blurry uh, because of that turbulence. And when you take a lot of one or two, yeah, like, uh, 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 short exposure pictures, uh, supposedly you can then, uh, you can then uh, yeah, like 
it's a it's a workaround around the turbulence that you might otherwise see. So when you also are focused on the moon, um, I think a lot of people did that already. You can always see that turbulence. You always see these craters, um, like uh, yeah, going from left to right in your or up or up and down in your picture. It's it's a little bit like looking through water at the moon. And that's actually what you may, may be, you, you can, you can improve on that by engaging in lucky imaging and you get, you get supposedly get a sharper picture, but then you also should be focused on a very bright object like the planets. So planetary imaging is a very good example where people take a lot of like, uh, five millisecond pictures and they end up with five or six thousand pictures of Jupiter and they, they, they select the highest quality frames and then they end up with a nice picture. Anyway, of course, I missed a lot of chats, <laughs> but I'm glad to see that there are nine, 39 people in the chat and I see you are also helping each other out. So yeah, that is my, um, always my main goal. And it's so great to see you all in the chat. So thank you very much for joining, even though I am engaging in deep sky imaging and I don't have, I can't, I, I, I'm just showing you five minute exposures here. Um, and I do hope you have, uh, yeah, I am making some sense in explaining stuff in astrophotography and, um, I'm always happy to learn more. So if people, uh, are making comments about Nina, which I never use because I'm using Sequence Generator Pro, that's good information. Um, uh, did it? I think I, yeah, Dennis, that was your question. <laughs> I should update my, 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 I should have, uh, not, not, have not used my phone for the chat. But anyway, very nice tracking. Yes, Don, I'm very happy with the tracking. The E26R Pro mount is great. Yeah, I do like almost everything about the E26R Pro mount, except for the handle at the back of the mount, uh, which you need to polar align. But, uh, supposedly there's a workaround. I actually ordered, uh, like, uh, a workaround that takes care of that issue. It's like a printed, uh, 3D knob I could use on the back of the EQ6R Pro, but I ordered it online and it never, <laughs> I don't think it, it, it ever came to my house. And I know that there is a lot of back, or you can say this, there's a lot of back ordering, uh, in the SF photography, uh, shops right now because of, uh, COVID also. I, I hope I will get it one day. I think my mount was the Dombey Dalek Observatory. I think my mount has issues with SEQGT. I've polar aligned using Pole Master and have it on a fixed pier. Yet my graph is all over the place. Hmm. Yeah, that's quite annoying. When you put a lot of time into polar aligning and you still end up with Suboptimal tracking. I know your pain. Uh, dumpy. And, um, yeah, what, what can be, of course, you have gear in RA and deck and maybe, um, I don't know. You can hyper tune your mount. Uh, I never did it actually, but, um, yeah, maybe some people in the chat can help you out there. Macarono, more shorter exposures are maybe a bit sharper, less longer exposures might show more detail, but that the difference is really small. Actually, I should do that. I will, will compare the two. Um, starting taking short exposures, 10 minutes. Wow, Jim, that's great. Are you doing narrow band or are you under really dark skies? Um, yeah, I'm also interested in what target you are imaging then. And Jack says, thank you for taking the time to answer my question. You're welcome, Jack. Um, the Dumpy Dalek Observatory again. My CCD is about 12 years old. <laughs> I really need to trade it in. Yeah, and uh, Dumpy, if I may call you that. Uh, there has been, I, I would say there has been a revolution in, uh, in cameras uh, for the past 10 years where everybody was using CCD cameras. And if you look at the astro uh, photography community right now, most of us, including myself, are using CMOS-based uh, uh, sensors. And um, I think maybe CCD has a little bit the upper hand, but especially the higher quality CMOS 
sensors are now that good um, that you you don't see uh, a lot of difference between CCDs and CMOS anymore. Uh, and because, because CMOS sensors are, of course, of course also mass produced, it, it makes the cameras cheaper and it makes astrophotography more as accessible also for people. So that's also really nice to see. Um, yeah. And I do have, of course, videos on what kind of cameras uh, are out there on the astrophotography market. So if you're interested in that, you can check out my channel. Um, Don R says, can drizzling take the place of calibration frames? Uh, poo. Yeah, drizzling can help a little bit to improve the your like the, the pin the, the sharpness of your picture. But I don't think it will take care of, um, like, it, you have some vignetting, for instance, in your lens, and flat frames take care of that particular vignetting. Sometimes you have some dust bunnies. Uh, and also dark frames, it takes care of uh, the noise in your sensor, and I don't think Grizzling can do that. So I would recommend you still try to take dark frames and calibrate your light frames with darks and flats. Holly is answering donkey? Okay. <laughs> you mean dithering, not drizzle, right? Ah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was also thinking about drizzle. Uh, yeah, dithering definitely also helps. But I'm, I'm using both all the time, drizzling and dithering. Or drizzling, dittering, and uh, calibration frames. Now I'm making the same mistake. What telescope do you recommend for beginners? Yeah, that depends on your interest. That's the exact question I would ask, uh, Buzz. Um, do you want to engage in visual observations? Do you want to engage in planetary imaging and moon imaging? Um, do you also want to engage in deep sky astrophotography? And depending on Answering all of these questions, you, I would recommend different telescopes and gear. And be, yeah, if you're a beginner and I was the same, usually you, you, you start asking yourselves, I just want a telescope uh, with which I can do any, everything. <laughs> I want a telescope where I can just look through the iPad piece. I want that te telescope also to be good at planetary and moon photograph photography. And I want that telescope to be good at deep sky astrophotography. Um, and I would say there are maybe particular telescopes that are a little bit a jack of all trades. Um, but yeah, uh, usually you want, you want to choose either one or the other. If you engage in deep sky astrophotography, I would say maybe start out with a refractor with a small focal length. Uh, and I would advise you to take a, an apochromatic refractor because it gives you good color corrected images. Um, Jim Astro is at Bortle 5. So, wow. And are you using a broadband filter still or a narrowband to take those 10 minute exposures, Jim? I'm really, uh, really interested. Maybe I should also crank up the, uh, the exposure time uh, here because I'm, my guiding is quite, quite good at the moment. Um, Astro Bloke has a great video on YouTube with step-by-step -step hyper tuning. Yeah, that's nice. Gary, thanks for pointing that out. Um, Macarono, I started with a 10 inch Smith Cassegrain telescope. Not easy. Guess I would start again with an 8 millimeter refractor if I could. Yeah, I, I would also advise you to when you just start out i would not take like a, a telescope i think the temptation is to to buy a, a large aperture and focal length telescope uh, because you get the resolution and it allows you to zoom in on deep sky astrophotography targets and yeah for visual observations it may be still is it's still the best option to take a very big dobsonian telescope at a reasonable price to engage in vis visual observations uh, but especially when you want to get into astrophotography and deep sky imaging, I would really advise you to start with a short focal length refractor telescope. Um, also, yeah, you don't, the, the maintenance is pretty low on those refractors. 
usually you don't need to engage in any collimation. They are lightweight. They are easy to store in the house and so on. Uh, and you can uh, you can take some great images of some nebulas that are like thousands or ten thousands of light years away in our Milky Way. So that's pretty awesome. Sometimes it's better to start with binoculars. Yes, of course. That's always nice. Ah, you're doing narrowband HA imaging, Jim. Yeah. Then I can understand your 10 minute exposures. And maybe you have like a small three nanometer uh, HA filter. I don't know. 80 millimeter APO, APO refractors are very forgiving. Yes, I totally agree. Oh, but I am so, actually, I'm so happy, guys, that I have some uh, O3 data on the Crescent Nebula. I hope I can also um, post process that nicely. Um, I'm really hoping to get that shock shell image also of the, the Crescent Nebula. And I was actually also surprised to see, uh, I, I started with imaging uh, sulfur, uh, with a sulfur narrowband uh, filter, but I didn't get, well, I almost didn't get any signal out of the Crescent. So it appears that most of the signal in this particular target is in the HA and the O3 uh, narrowband filters. And I think now I'm coming up at about 10 minutes. I'm coming up at the H alpha filter again. And unfortunately, I don't have any electronic focuser. <laughs> so actually, I think I will go up the balcony and uh, refocus my, uh, my telescope if needed. I will check out the first picture. Usually there's a very st small difference in the focus of my O3 filter as compared to the H alpha filter I use. I don't know why. But we'll check it out. So maybe I will go up in a few minutes. Having my eye on the 26 MC Pro or the Altair 26 color. Yeah, I don't know. Does the Altair also include a hub? I, I really like the ASI 1600 Monopro because it also has two USB hubs. And, uh, I'm always using my filter wheel uh, to connect to that uh, camera. So I don't need an extra power supply. But these small differences you can look into. Um, but I think they are using the same sensor, right? So the devil is a little bit in the detail, I think. I have a 2600 color camera, which I'm very happy with, especially when paired with a multi narrow band filter. Yes, that's of course also a way to get into narrow band um, astrophotography is just to use a dual or a tri band filter um, with a color camera. And you are, you will uh, collect a little bit less light because of the Bayer matrix. But anyway, I saw some amazing pictures of people of taking pictures, for instance, of the Veil Nebula and the Cygnus Loop and everything. So, uh, yeah, there are some targets really, really well suited for uh, for dual or tri-band imaging with a color camera as well. And, of course, it makes the post-processing uh, a lot easier when you just have to deal with one stack instead of... I'm actually thinking about creating an HOO stack of the Crescent Nebula here. Um, so, yeah. Hope you will... Uh, hope that will work out for you. Okay, Oli has some information because he is using the 2600 MC. If you get a scope that shoots a flat field camera that has a good resolution, you can discern details like those higher magnification scopes. Hmm. I really didn't know. <laughs> I'm saving my pennies. I tried out the IDAS dual band nebula filter last night, which seemed to work uh, well. Yeah, that's of course also a question. Like, what is your budget? That's always the question in astrophotography. 
And usually I have a budget in my mind and then I see something great I want to uh, to invest in and then I cross that budget. Yeah. Ah, Gary, that's a good question. No, I didn't yet. Um, didn't use a sodium wavelength filter. Uh, I, I, for now, I, um, I think for the past year, I have been sticking with uh, H alpha S two and O three because, yeah, those are the I think the most popular and also, uh, yeah, uh, filters that you can use to bring out uh, these specific gases in deep space targets. But uh, I, I can really imagine that there are more. Uh, filters like the sodium filter, I think, um, with which you can, like, maybe make some interesting combinations with the more classic filters as well. So, uh, yeah, I will look into that. Thank you for the suggestion. So we are coming up at, let's see. Now I still have five minutes left uh, before I will go uh, up. And yeah, the main question is, of course, should I leave the stream on? <laughs> um, don't know. Maybe a little bit uh, uh, quiet. <laughs> I think it's worth it. Okay. Whoa, planetary images in the house. Hello, planetary images. Filter recommendation for the Iris Nebula. Don R, I think the Iris Nebula, is that a broadband target? Does anybody know? I think it's not a, it's not emitting a lot of light in the uh, narrow band, like the H alpha and the uh, the sulfur and the oxygen part of maybe the oxygen. It is. I think the Iris Nebula is a broadband filter, so you should you could use a light pollution filter. I think for the Iris uh, like a broadband filter for the Iris Nebula and not a narrow band filter. But uh, please correct me if I am wrong. Stay on, Jim says. Okay, Jim, I think when I come back, you might be the only one in the jet. RGB, yeah. So everybody agrees it's a reflection nebula. So it's a broadband target, basically. And you also have this with uh, galaxies, of course. So, um, yeah, I, I was imaging the Whirlpool and the Pinwheel Galaxy from the, from my balcony in the city. And that is super challenging because I do have to deal with light pollution. Even though I am using a light pollution filter, I still get a lot of light pollution when I'm taking like two or three minute pictures. So usually I uh, I, I try out different things. I have tried to take uh, long exposure pictures and try to uh, like try to deal with that light pollution in post processing, which sometimes works, but it's not the best uh, picture you end up with. Uh, I also try to take like more shorter exposure pictures of particular uh, brighter objects like galaxies. That seems to work a little bit better. So if you are under light polluted skies and you want to image a galaxy or a broadband uh, uh, um, target like the Irish Nebula apparently because it's a reflection nebula, uh, you might want to look into a light pollution filter in combination with limiting your exposure time and taking more pictures and stack them. BS is in the house. He, sees, he or she says, hi, everyone. I don't use color filters. Okay, Don. Good to hear. I tried my solar sodium filter on a couple of emission nebula. Very weird results. Oh, no. Now I'm interested, Gary. Um, do you have actually uh, uh, your own site or where did you post that picture? <laughs> and what target was it? Stay on, we'll wait. Okay, it's already half past one for me. 
So, um, okay, I will try to stay on and uh, I could also just, let's see. Oh, I'm, yeah, so you can see here, uh, you, you probably can because it's very tiny, but uh, there are 100 seconds left, after which I will be switching to the H alpha filter. And I just, I, I could just wait for the first, now wait, let's not wait for the first. Because I can show you a couple of things, of course. So let's, you can pause the sequence in Sequence Generator Pro. And uh, then you can actually already switch your filter to the HA filter. And then you can take like two second pictures to look at the frame and focus. And actually we have some in the Netherlands, we don't have great, great HFRs. <laughs> Uh, due to the astronomical scene conditions. It's okay, 60 seconds to go. Uh, of course, I will go to bed at one point. I think when I, when I, uh, uh, fine tune the H alpha filter. Um, but anyway, we can, we can spend a half an hour more. <laughs> Let's see, 40 seconds to go. I think I did, yeah, I really hope if I stack all of these, I'm going back now. If I stack all, you see a little bit of dithering going on. Scrolling back here, I think when I stack all of these images, I really hope I will get some nice oxygen data on the crescent. We can't wait if you need a coffee boost. Yeah, <laughs> I really need one. I have some, uh, some, uh, oh, can I make a commercial? Cola, where is it? Oh, of course I cannot see it because my, I'm lagging behind if I'm looking at my own chat. <laughs> oh, that was it. It was it, guys. Here, we are at 30 frames. What I'm doing always, I don't know if anybody else uses Sequence Generator Pro, is I go to this filter setting and I'm already switching them to HA. And then I can just press set. And of course it will then move to the HA filter. And then I take a couple of short exposure pictures just, just to see the results. So I'm pressing start here on frame and focus. Oh, there's not much to go on. Here you see, I, I'm a little bit out of focus. So I will go up and I can't use my bedroom because my, uh, my wife and my children are asleep there. So I will, I will go up the stairs that is outside of the house. And that's a pretty tricky deal. <laughs> so I have to jump over the fence and everything to get on my balcony. So if I don't return, maybe somebody can call. Uh, it's not 911 in the Netherlands, it's, it's 112. Um, anyway, hope to be back in a couple of minutes. And if you see some wobbling, that's because my uh, I have a wooden balcony. So the stars will be a little bit, uh, yeah, like out of focus or whatever. Um, okay. And I think, oh, that's a little bit tricky. I need to see this because I have, to, I, ah, I, I know, uh, I know workaround. Okay. Okay.
So, yeah, it's a bit weird because usually I have better HFRs. Um, but I do just see some pinpoint stars. So I'm just trusting my eyes here. And yeah, let's take the first long exposure H alpha uh, picture. So resuming. Oh, yeah, it's always asking me to. I'm cooling at minus 15 at the moment because it's, it was pretty hot today. Uh, let's check this off. Oh, oh, wait. Let's see if PhD2 already settled. You can see here, I was on the balcony here and here. And clearly, I need to lose weight. <laughs> oh, yeah. COVID. Um, let's check this out. Okay, it's actually taking the first long exposure H alpha picture. And for those of you who were here last night, um, you already saw a couple of pictures in uh, hydrogen alpha, of course. And still 39 people here. Uh, that's great. <laughs> Glad you could stay. Uh, why in the world do you don't have an autofocuser? Yeah, Manfred, I don't have one. <laughs> um, so if anybody knows a good autofocus for the Edge HD, I'm all, I'm all ears, actually. And um, yeah, you know, on the other hand, it took me like two minutes or three minutes. <laughs> it's not on my first telescope. I know that I, I don't know if you can use the electronic autofocuser of uh, ZWO for it, it's on an Edge HD. Trevor, I'm learning. The Senso Sesto 2. Hey, Macarono, that's good. That is uh, from Prima Luce Lab, I think. Eh? I'm learning. Ah, good, you have you learned something clever. My deck is asphalt, so I can jump up and down on mine, and it doesn't bother the scope. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, uh, I did that for my second, I have two balconies. So the balcony on the second floor, it does have like the, the stones. Uh, so that's, uh, I, I need to do that still for my first balcony as well. Oh, and I'm now a little bit, did I also put the H alpha to unity gain? I hope I did. Yeah, okay, event gain 139. Yeah, that's great. So yeah. 136 seconds to go. Okay, Monfred says, wants to one of my pictures from Australia. I don't know exactly what you mean by that, Monfred. Uh, it's only 3.47. <laughs> really done. Where are you then? 3.47 p.m., I would say, in the U.S. I use an Optech Low Profile Focuser Rotator System on my Tech 200 millimeters. A Sesto Sensor on my 127ED and a ZWO EAF on my Edge 80. Okay, that's nice. I couldn't imagine not having an electronic focuser any longer, yeah. Gary, at one point, of course, I will get one too. And the ZWO works on an SET. So yeah, guys, I'm just sticking around for a couple of HA pictures, and then um, I have to go to bed. <laughs> I'm pretty sleepy. I'm pretty sleepy. Uh, let's see. Oh, that's not good. Three seconds. 
Hey, but actually, when you do not have an autofocuser, you are. You, I, I was, I was under the stars yeah, for a couple of minutes. <laughs> I went out and I actually checked uh, checked the sky. So that's maybe one advantage I can think of. The only one. Uh, sometimes I was, uh, I had this like PhD two guiding issue, and I couldn't figure out why it was not showing stars and why it wouldn't guide. And then I went outside like, after uh, like thirty minutes, and uh, <laughs> it was cloudy. <laughs> Clouds had ro rolled in, so that happens sometimes when you are astro into astrophotography and you're totally involved in the software settings and everything. You forget to check the sky. Here we go. Hopefully. Okay. I call that a pretty good HL picture of the Crescent Nebula. What are your thoughts? <laughs> I think I will not mess with it anymore. Ah, okay. If you want to see one of my Espro pictures from my site in Austria, yeah, of course. Monfred, let me know. Do you have an Instagram? Do you have uh, an Espro bin account? Just let me know. I will check it out. Don R says nice. Aha. Thank you, Don. I think I will be sticking around for one or two more. To be sure, I do think it's a little bit... Uh, I'm always thinking it's not completely in the center. No, close enough, close enough. Yeah, let's check out the PhD to writing. Yeah, it's still good. And uh, yeah, I uh, I forgot again to do the multi-star guiding. I uh, I have this. This is version is the mm, let's see the two point six point one version. And you have of course the Dev four version, which includes multi-star guiding. And I used that a couple of times, and it got me I think about the tenth. Of an arc second better guiding, something like that. So it's marginal, but it is better. An all sky camera is a good idea to monitor conditions. Yeah. Yeah. I would actually love to build an observatory. Uh, but that it is not feasible where I live, live right now in the city. But if, uh, yeah. Would be would be great to have an observatory and also a, a camera with an all, all sky view. Um, yeah, I think that that will be one of my dreams. I will work towards during the the next couple of years. Uh, I, I think it would be awesome to have like a, a, a dark a darker sky site where I just uh, have those things. Have an observatory where I can drive to maybe if it's not too far from my house. And then just image a night sky uh, and and to do do live streams from there. That would be great. Manfred has to go to bed. Yeah, me too, uh, Manfred. Uh, gute Nacht. So how are the weather conditions? I think it will stay clear tonight. Um, oh, I quit everything. Weer mm, Plaza, the Dutch weather site. Although Plaza is not a Dutch word, it's an Italian word. It, uh, Um, no, this is not what I'm looking for. So, cloud radar. In Dutch, the Dutch word for cloud is walk. 
Yeah, it's getting closer. But it's in Belgium, not yet here in the Netherlands. I think I'm lucky. Ooh. Yeah, I'm lucky, I think. Right, so this will be the final night. And I, of course, um, I hope to present a decent image of the Crescent Nebula. Um, we'll try to post-process this data during the weekend. And um, yeah, we'll post it, uh, if it's any good, on uh, on Instagram or what is it? Astrobin or uh, even YouTube has posts now, I saw. So maybe I can post it on YouTube as well, as we are here on YouTube live together. Um, we'll let you know the results. Yeah, Jim, thanks. I have a good run of clear skies, yeah. I think we had some hazy nights where I could engage into planetary imaging. And now we have two really clear nights that made me uh, switch from planetary to uh, deep sky again. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm uh, because I think in August, the, the weather was really awful here in, uh, in Western Europe. We, we went uh, three weeks without any uh, any clear skies. So that was a little bit hard, and it's really nice to see that early September we we again have some uh, some nice skies. I have to do some work, Ollie. You don't have to apologize. Thanks for uh, joining again, and I hope you have a good day in Australia. See you later, Ollie. And there's somebody from. Japan or China, I don't know, did you say hi? So, hi there. Um, right, is this, this is not, a, this is not the second one, right? This is still the first one. It is already the second one. Ah, okay. I'm always checking a couple of pictures to look at my focus. I think it is good. Hmm, I'm not cooling at minus 20. I do see some noise in the picture. But I hope that when I stack 50 of these H alpha images to uh, to get a decent, uh, decent stacked picture. It's a really cool object, actually. <laughs> I think, at least. Ah, South Korea. Hi. Welcome. So you are also already in the, it's, it's like already in the morning for you. So I will wait for one more H alpha picture. And if that turns out to be fine, uh, then I'm going to sleep as well. Yup, you're still there. You, for you, it's also one o'clock, right? Thanks, Vito. I learned a lot. I'm still outside. The temperature is really nice. But I need to go to bed now. Great, I, uh I hope you enjoyed some nice uh, clear skies. Yeah, apparently you did. And I'm, I'm actually a little bit curious that where you are somewhere in the Netherlands, where the skies are a little bit darker than Utrecht, uh, hopefully. And uh, yeah, have a good night. So any final thoughts? Now's the time. <laughs> One o'clock sharp, yes. And it's true, Joop. You have to be a little bit crazy to get into astrophotography, of course. Um, but actually, I'm kind of used to it because I, when I was younger, a little bit younger, I used to play in um, a band also. We had some live performances in uh, bars where we would play blues, whatever, pop music. Uh, and uh, yeah, usually it went on for about uh, like uh, until two o'clock or two thirty sometimes. And we also had then to, to beg for our money or to try to get our money, of course. 
And that took always also uh, an extra half hour. And then we had to pack up our gear. Like uh, I, I was playing the synthesizer, actually. <laughs> And head back back home. That usually took another hour, and then we were all always we were always very hungry, and we would stop at this swarma place. I don't know if you have them in the U.S. Swarma, like it's a Turkish kind of meat. Um, now yeah, anyway, it's it's a thing in the in the Netherlands, and uh, we really enjoyed like all that that fat food. Uh, we took some fries with it as well, <laughs> and that kind of if I'm doing astrophotography, I in in this late hour, it kind of reminds me of those times. Anyway, Perry is also leaving. Bye, Perry. Thanks for joining. Oh, Vels of Hook, yeah, you already said that. Oh, it's a lot of light pollution. Yeah, yeah, you have the the harbor there, of course, or not? At least, yeah, it depends a little bit. Checking in, just got a recommendation for your channel. Oh, that's nice to see that other people recommend my channel. Thank you, James, and uh, thank you for joining. And Swarma, you also know that in the US, that's nice to hear. Um, yeah, unfortunately, you are joining at a point where I am about to leave. <laughs> so, uh, sorry for that. Uh, I'm waiting for this final picture. And that was the final picture, I think, I wanted to check. Um, so we have H alpha 4, H alpha 2. Let's see. Yeah, we have three 15 minute data here. And I'm happy with it. I'm happy with the pinpoint accurate stars, actually. So, um, guys and girls, maybe. Um, Thank you so much for joining and thank you for participating and giving each other information, asking me questions about astrophotography. Always happy to do that on the live stream. Um, I think the next live stream will take a couple of days or even weeks because when we look at actually, let's check it. I always also like to do maybe a half moon or a full moon live session. So check out if if it's half moon or full moon i usually try to set up my rig if it is clear and aim it at the moon and just talk about astrophotography um and i should maybe plan these sessions more but unfortunately i cannot plan clear skies i'm just checking the the weather conditions for the next few weeks why isn't it showing that this is a terrible side actually um whoa well, okay that's still the two the 14 days that's what we want it's very unreliable but i always like to check thursday what is this i got ah here friday saturday now maybe next week sunday monday tuesday wednesday there are some like if it this these kind of weather conditions when you have 50 or 60 percent sun usually they are not good for deep sky astrophotography right um, but you can do some planetary imaging, or maybe I will aim it at the moon. Something like that. <laughs> anyway, Brazil is also in the house, I see. Thanks again, appreciate it. Thank you, John. Thank you, Boss. Uh, thank you, Jack. And solar sessions. I don't have a solar scope yet. I have to buy one before I can get into that. But I do know that uh, yeah, we all know Chuck probably, Chuck's astrophotography. If you're looking for some great live solar sessions from, I think he's in Detroit, right? Um, that's a good channel to look out for. Um, it's a super night. And one final question, is there an asteroid coming to Earth? There are always asteroids circling around our solar system, but none of them will hit Earth in the near future, as far as I know. All right, guys. I will leave you with this H Alpha picture of the Crescent Nebula. And thank you so much for joining and uh, have a nice day evening or morning and i hope to see you again in one of my other live streams or one of my other videos of course so thank you and good night